morning. This is Dr. John Bennett televising for Neurosurgical TV from Miami. We have here another co uh, conference in the uh, 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 co overall conference of pediatric neurosurgery in collaboration with uh, Deepak Gupta of the Department of Neurosurgery of the AIMS uh, Hospital in New Delhi. Today we have the pleasure of having Professor uh, Jane. He's going to be talking about management of CBJ anomalies in children, personal experience. And, but first I'd like to introduce, introduce the panel before I turn it over to Dr. Jain. Hello, Deepak. Hello, uh, uh, Dr. Jain, uh, welcome on this platform and uh, I want to thank you for sparing out your time uh, to uh, share with us your valuable experience on uh, cranial vertebral junction anomalies. And I'm, I know that you have the largest amount of experience in India and I'm sure uh, we look just to uh, listen from you, sir. Welcome, sir. Very good. Natarahan, can you hear me okay? Can you introduce yourself, please? Unmute and introduce yourself. You can? Dr. Uh, Deepak. Well, we left there for a moment. Okay, Simon. Welcome. Hello, Professor Jane. My name is uh, Simon Downs. I'm in Tokyo. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here as a medical student to enjoy your presentation. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Very good. Welcome, Dr. Jane. It's all yours. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Simon, and thank you, Dr. Deepak Gupta. So here I go. I start off. Yes, and please. Uh, let me tell you, this is my first experience to be presenting online. Okay. So there might be some hits here and there. Please excuse me for that. That's okay. And this subject of CV junction anomalies is quite a vast subject, and it is not easy to uh, cover it up in such a short time. So what I'll do, I'll just... Uh, talk about some of my ideas which are there and hopefully I will be able to explain those things. So I will concentrate only on few small points. So mainly uh, when we talk of CV junction anomalies. You want to screen share uh, Dr. Jane? Yeah. It's not screen sharing yet. Yeah. I have to share the screen. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think now we can share the screen. Yes, yes, we can see it. Perfect. Yeah. So when we talk about CV junction anomalies, there are mainly three uh, management issues. One is atlanto axial dislocation. The second thing, many people what they call as basilar invagination, and third thing is uh, uh, Arnold Cherry malformation. What you fell off the screen share? Go back on, please. Just full screen, I'll yes, do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go, there you go. Yeah, no, it's full screen, I think. Yes, it is. So, as I was telling you, main problems are atlantoaxial dislocation, something called as basilar invagination, and Arnold Cherry malformation. So, I'll not be talking about Arnold Cherry malformation today. I'll be basically telling about my thoughts of atlantic cell dislocation and basilar invagination. So if we talk of atlantic cell dislocation, the easiest one, easiest one is reducible atlantic cell dislocation. And was it it? What it is? I divide them in two types. One is mobile, wherein in flexion you have dislocation as you see in this picture. And in extension, the dislocation reduces completely and arch, the odontoid touches the arch of atlas anteriorly. The other entity called as hypermobile AAD, this is more dangerous, wherein in flexion, the, the, there is a dislocation posteriorly and in extension, there is dislocation anteriorly of the C2. This is because the os odontoidium or fractured odontoid is lying above against the arch, between arch and the transverse ligament, but the body is free to move forward and backward. So in flexion, the body of C2 moves backwards and in extension, it moves forward. It even goes under the arch of atlas. So the main thing to realize this is during anesthesia, we cannot intubate in extension position easily. We have to do, in these cases, we have to do fiber optic intubation and we be very careful that we don't extend or flex the neck too much. Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, sir, we hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so 
So that was about reducible AAD. Now I talk about the fixed atlanto axial dislocation or which is called irreducible AAD. What does it mean? In flexion and extension, the dislocation does not reduce. You see in this picture, the jaw is near the spine here and in extension it is so far away but it is still dislocated. Another picture is here, you see the jaw, the mandible is seen near the spine and it is so far away. So it is real extension at the atlanto axial joint but it's still it is not reducing. So this is called fixed. Some people say that it should be put on traction and then we will call it fixed. Now there is another entity where people say fixed atlanto axial dislocation with basilar invagination. What do they mean by that? You see the odontoid goes inside the foramen magnum and they call it as basilar invagination. Another picture, you see the odontoid is going inside the foramen magnum, so people call it basilar invagination. You see another picture, this is C2-3 fusion, C2 is completely inside, C3 vertebral body is against the arch of atlas. So this is called as basilar invagination. Now I'll further talk about this later on when I clarify these things. Yeah, another picture of basilar invagination, you see this C2 body is completely inside the foramen magnum, inflection and extension both. Now the, the, the now we have talked about two entities, one is fixed atlanto axial dislocation, one is basilar invagination. Now when we talk about fixed atlanto axial dislocation, uh, I must tell you that the atlanto axial joint is the most mobile joint of the body. And why should it get fixed? One has to find out the reason of fixity of atlanto axial dislocation. Is it only x-ray which is not done properly? Is it muscle spasm in the neck which is not allowing movement at that joint? So, and uh, once we talk of management of all these things, all dislocations should be reduced. If they cannot reduce on flexion, extension, traction, then we should open the joints and by open method we should reduce all these joints. That is a basic uh, fundamental uh, management in all orthopedics dislocations and if you cannot reduce it then you have to do orthodesis in the position of maximum utility of that joint. Now as I was talking to you earlier that in a fixed atlanto axial dislocation we should try and find out what is fixing it and why it is getting fixed and then we should treat that cause and not the effect. The effect is dislocation where many times transoral surgery is done to decompress it. But if we can reduce it, we should first try to reduce. All efforts should be made to reduce that dislocation. So there are certain causes where you, I'll show you in traumatic, like if odontoid has slipped in front of arch of atlas, like this. In this picture, you see this odontoid has slipped in front of the arch of atlas. This just cannot be pushed back because the arch of atlas will prevent it. So by going transoral, we resect this odontoid and do reduction like this. You see, this is post-operative in reduced position. Another thing, in traumatic cases, there may be callus formation and fibrotic uh, joint shear. So, or pseudoarthrosis, pseudo which this will not allow it to come forward. Like this, again, these are so uh, much engaged fracture segments. They will not just move. There is pseudoarthrosis here. And in third picture, you can see the malunion in dislocated position. So you have to correct these things by going transoral and remove this and make it free. Then only it will reduce. So, and coming to basilar invagination, my idea of basilar invagination. You see these three pictures. One, two, and three and if you see all three are different it are, are all these basilar imagination one entity no they are all different so what we should do you see for basilar imagination a lot of lines have been described like this this and Wackenheim's line and all these all lines were described at a time when we had only plain x-ray no CT scan was available so these lines were described at that time and they could not see C1, C2 so clearly as we see nowadays. So nowadays these lines are not so important. What I say that these lines and there are so many angles, they will give you indirect information between the cranium and axis because one part, one point is cranium like uh, palate or and the other point is again cranium, maybe posterior margin of foramen magnum or other margin. And so you just see how much above is the odontoid. So this is the relationship between cranium and axis. But we do not see if there is a problem at atlanto-axial joint. We don't 
try to look at the abnormal relationship of atlas and axis. So all these lines are like that. So what I call something like central dislocation. For me, so-called Bessler imagination is central dislocation, where the C2 moves up into the foramen magnum. So in this picture, if you see, this is the foramen magnum base of skull, what I call, if this, this base of skull goes up, then I would call it basilar imagination. And in that situation, the joints, atlantoaxial joint you see in coronal here and you see in sagittal here, would be normal. These joints would be normal. And C2, C1, C2 and C1 relationship would be absolutely normal. So that you can call as uh, basilar imagination. Like in this picture, you see this. This is the foramen magnum. But if you see C1, C2 relationship joint, they are all normal. So this you can call as, and if you see base from posterior to anterior, it's almost flattened. You call it platybasia. You call it uh, um, hypoplasia of clivus, basilar imagination. That's all fine. But this is uh, not atlantoaxial dislocation. There is no atlantoaxial dislocation here. Another picture. You see such a high odontoid. If you will draw those lines, it will be called basilar imagination. And but C1, C2 relationship is absolutely normal. So this you can call as basilar imagination. Yeah. So now normally this is very common picture in India when we see that there is a dislocation, the odontoid is going up. So this we generally call as fixed atlantoaxial dislocation with basilar imagination. But this is not so. You see this, you will call it basilar imagination. So what I call it is uh, depicted in this picture. When the C2 goes up, I call it axial imagination or central dislocation. Then the, there will be, this joint will not be normal also. You will see some abnormality dislocation at the joint also. So this uh, we will call is axial imagination or central dislocation. Just an example, you see here in this MRI, the so much of axis has gone up, so it is axial invagination. In this CT scan, you see this axis C2 has gone completely inside. So I will call it as axial invagination. So again, coming back to the management, all dislocations should be reduced. If they cannot be reduced by closed method, then they should be reduced by open method. And then orthodesis should be done in the position of maximum utility. Now, how do we plan surgery? We have to see all these CT scans in 3D and sagittal, coronal, and make 3D imagination and find out what is the abnormal relationship between atlas and axis. What is the problem at atlanto-axial joints? And then determine the direction of abnormal displacements, whether it is gone posteriorly, has it rotated to right, it has rotated to left, or it has gone up. And then you have to reverse the this, these displacements to restore normal anatomy. For doing this, you have to open the C1, C2 joints, align C1 and C2, and then fuse it in the reduced position on reduced condition. So we have three approaches for that, mainly two, posterior approach and transoral approach. But sometimes you can go posterior and not able to reduce it, then go transoral and uh, re remove the offending element and then go again posteriorly. So now I'll just show a few examples. The trick lies in understanding the orientation of the joints and changing it to get normal alignment of atlas and axis. So this 12-year-old boy who had orthodontidium and fixed AAD, you see this is the MRI. You can see this plantoaxial dislocation. And here is the right side joint. Here is the left side joint. There is some dislocation. C2 is behind. C2 facet is behind the C1 on both sides. Now. You see in the CT scan, again, this is the joint which is seen. C2 is a little behind. So this should go down here. And this is, again, in flexion, you see, and this is in extension. This is not reducible, but you can see the joints. They are seen beautifully. So what is required is this arch of atlas and C2 should come together here. So you should rotate it in such a way, rotate it in such a way that this moves forward, this moves forward, and this goes up. So you see, this is the pre-op CT scan. This is the post-operative CT scan. We have done bilateral transarticular screw fixation, and this is completely reduced in mid-sagittal view. And here you see this giant 
this surface has come down which was here so it has rotated like this and it has reduced completely and we have done bilateral transarticular fusion and in the midline we have done sublaminar wiring and bone fusion also another 16 year old boy who has got congenitally c1 assimilated c23 fusion so called fixed atlanto axial dislocation and so called basilar imagination See this plain x-ray, he had traction for seven days, no change in plain x-ray. In this MRI, if you can see this, uh, you see this joint on the right side here, joint starts, you can see from here, here, come up to here, and then midline there is this uh, basilar imagination so-called, and then again you move to the left side, you see this joint again. So, so again, the same thing, this has to be moved forward and then it would reduce this should come down so you see in 3d view joints are beautifully seen on both sides so there is nothing which prevents prevent which is preventing movement between the joint or between c1 and c2 so this is after surgery this has moved completely down and reduced here and then we have put transarticular screw here and you see this joint C2 has moved forward and downward, C2 here has moved forward and downward. So this is completely reduced and now we move on to another 17 year old girl who also had C1 assimilation, C2, 3 fusion, fixed AAD and so called basilar imagination. Okay. I'll just take one second, excuse me. Okay. You're going to show a video or? Because you're off the screen share, Doc. Actually, okay. You're not, you're not off the screen share. Yeah, you're off the screen share. Yeah, now okay. it's okay. Yeah you're, yeah, you're back on, but it's not as big yeah. as it was before. Right. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. This is another 17 year old girl. Here you see this. I have just made these arrows to show that this should move forward and this should move downwards. If we can do that movement by opening these joints, you see right side joint and left side joint, just push it forward and downwards, it would completely reduce. So called basilar imagination and dislocation both would reduce. And you see this in this picture, these are the preoperative ones and this post operative one. The odontoid has completely come down and touching the arch of atlas here and then this is transarticular screw on right side, this is transarticular screw on left side. See the difference between the joint here and joint here. The orientation has completely changed and then this is posterior fusion by making arch of atlas and trans uh, and laminar screws, sublaminar screws. This trans artificial arch of atlas technique I have described long back so I will not anyway go in details of this technique now and uh, coming to next patient who had fixed AAD basilar imagination and all cherry malformation and syrinx all things in one boy so here you go you see this MRI you can see this and all cherry malformation syrinx and this is the dislocation here these are the CT scans dislocation with a little bit of basilar imagination and this joint these joints do not appear to be dislocated even then there is dislocation so we have to move C2 forward and downward again mainly forward and if you see this post operative images this C2 has moved so much forward and on this side also it has moved so much forward and here it is completely reduced and we have done uh, foramen magnum decompression also and this is what you are seeing as the rib graft on right side and this is on the left side and this has taken up the patient has come for follow up after four years and this is completely taken up rib graft. Now there is another patient where I went for posteriorly, this is 12 year old boy with osphodontoidium and fixed AAD and this patient was admitted in orthopedics. For 14 days he was on traction but there was no change in the dislocation, it did not reduce and you see the CT scan, it appears to be odontoid, osphodontoidium. This child had history of falls during last one year three times, every time he developed quadruplegia, last fall was three months back and from that quadruplegia he did not improve and he was bedridden, he had severe spastic quadruplegia. So, but I thought 
these are the joints if you can see this joint on this side this joint on this side I thought probably it will move forward by going posteriorly opening the joints there is some osteophyte formation also here so when I went posteriorly I, I opened the joint so joint was free I could uh, rotate the joint but it just I could not push it forward so probably we thought that there is some pseudo arthrosis here and there must be fibrosis also so we should remove this much of bone to bring it down forward so this is what we have done I, this is the post by transoral approach we have removed that much of bone and then this is what is post operating you can see that that post odontoid is still remaining a little bit arch of atlas is also seen but only that offending element in between which was preventing this movement forward was removed and this is completely reduced now you see this this is the post operative plane x ray. Now, another similar type of boy, 10 year old boy, again post traumatic. You see this dislocation. Dislocation here, I thought I'll be able to reduce it. Joints are free. You can see coronal joints here. There is side to side dislocation also. So, this could not be reduced by posterior approach. Again, we went transfer, removed that offending element, and then it is completely reduced and aligned. You can see this. Again, coming back, see this, we have removed just this portion. And this has moved forward. In side to side dislocation has reduced completely. Now, this is six year old girl who had uh, assimilation of Petla C23 fusion and very severe dislocation over here. And then you see in MRI, the, the spinal cord is hardly seen here. And in CT scan, there is osodontoidium C23 fusion, and this is C3, which is at the level of arch of atlas. But the joint is seen nicely here. You can see joint nicely here. So I thought I'll be able to reduce it. You see, even in a 3D picture, you see this joint is seen nicely. And if you see here, whole joint surface is seen. And this C1 joint surface is vertical. If you can just rotate it and bring it on top of it, it would be normal alignment. That is what I thought. So I went posteriorly. I could uh, easily see the joint. And there was a lot of distance between this cranium and C2. It was easy to move. But even then, it was not completely reducing. So this is the one which, uh, by posterior approach, I put transarticular screws on both sides. And then, although it has reduced significantly, but even then there is a small dislocation here. Probably this odontoid prevented it or what, I am not very sure, but I could not reduce it completely. And then we had to do transural surgery and remove this part of the bone to provide a space. And this is the transural surgery and reduced it. This transural surgery was required because the patient came after about four months, she had come had weakness in one uh, right side of the upper limb. So therefore, when we did the transural approach in two months, that also completely improved. Now, this is probably the last thing which I am showing you. Sometimes, we'll say transural odontoidectomy. That is not the case. I don't, you see, in this patient, posterior fusion is done. Only odontoid has been removed, but still the, the skyphotic angle is present and there is a canal over here. So dislocation has not reduced and there is still compression of the cord. So it is not it is not transoral odontoidectomy which is required. It is transoral decompress, decompression of the compressed spinal cord and we have to remove sufficient bone in all three dimensions to be which is responsible for compression so that the dual sac falls into that gutter which we have created. So this CV junction is funnel shaped. We should make the thing funnel shaped by surgery. You have to remove this much of bone anteriorly to make it funnel shaped. To remove this much of bone, you have to go up to here to remove the bone. So this is 12 year old boy. You see here preoperatively this is the situation and posterior fusion has been done and odontoid has been removed but the compression is still persists so we have removed this much of bone from front and this is CT myelogram long time back we used to do CT myelogram and you see this died nicely it has been decompressed nicely another case 10 year old girl where 
again basilar imagination posterior fusion has been done and subsequently odontoid has been removed it appears only odontoid tip has been removed you will see other cuts you see this only tip has been removed and it appears by this so this is not sufficient and it's still causing pressure on the brain stem and spinal cord so now we have removed this much of bone again and this is the post operative film and that this is what i was telling the whole cord is gone inside the gutter which we have made if we have not done that much wide uh, corpectomy this would not come down inside this so this is last case i am trying going to show you my 36 year old girl and here you see this is completely gone inside c2 3 4 fusion and this lamina and parts everything is inside the foramen magnum and the joint i just could not make out where it is the joint is just in the first and lateral part of the c2 3 4 body there is no joint seen so i had no other choice i just went transurally and removed these two did corpect me for these two vertebrae removed completely you see this is post operative this is pre operative and transurally you see in axial views this much of space was created so this is how in some patients you would require transoral. So in case that you should, one should determine the direction of abnormal displacement of C1 and C2, reverse it to restore normal anatomy in all atlanto axial dislocations. One should determine the cause of fixity and try to remove it in fixed atlanto axial dislocation and restore the normal alignment and then therefore so-called fixed and irreducible AAD and so-called vision can all be reduced by a proper surgical technique. Sometimes transoral decompression may be required. It should not be odontoidectomy. The decompression should be generous. It should provide sufficient three-dimensional room to the decompressed neural sac to lie in the space. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Jane, for a top quality presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll ask you a quick question first. I saw a patient once with a transversal dantard and he had absolutely no symptoms. He could not lift his head. It was the only thing he had. Is it the same? Is pain a big component of atlantoaxial dislocations or is it immobility or lack of movement? I, I, I just could not get the question. He has only pain. Okay, he, the pain is a big component of these dislocations. Yeah, if there is only pain and there is dislocation, we have to treat it. We have to fix the dislocation. Okay, okay. Okay, any questions from uh, Simon or Dr. Gupta? Uh, Dr. Jain, very nice presentation. Congratulations. Uh, Thank you. You showed in your presentation in the last slide you mentioned uh, transoral decompression may be required. Yeah. However, it should be ordered to detect me. Uh, please elaborate yeah. further on that. Yeah, what I am saying is most often when the oral decompression is required, it is central dislocation or axial invagination. If, if that is not going inside the foramen magnum, then transoral decompression would not be required. All other would be completely reducible dislocations. So when you, if you do only odontoidectomy, you are just removing the tip of the C2, while the compressing element would be C2 body completely. Sometimes even C3 is inside the foramen magnum. So if you don't do corpactomy, you will not be doing sufficient decompression. I showed you two cases who had only odontoidectomy done, and they were still having the compression. Because the dislocation has not reduced, C2 body is still going back, so the, the pressure continues. Okay. And uh, how am I clear? Yeah, very clear. Thank you. How much importance you give to the verticality of the joint, the C1, C2 joints? In some patients, the C1, C2 joint is quite vertical. What uh, yeah. do you try to reduce Dr. those? Deepak. Dr. Deepak, you know, this was in the 90s when I said these joints are vertical. I have done a lot of studies. The joints are not really vertical. So if you want to say a joint is vertical, you should you have to give some reference point to which it is vertical. If you take uh, X-ray or CT scan in flexion, then the joints would be seen vertical. If you take in extension, then they would be in reverse direction. If you take in horizontal only, so the, 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 the verticality of joint is a very, very 
uh, tricky thing. I described it long back. Then we, what we did is we took a reference point of C2 body and tried to see if they are vertical or not. They are not really vertical. Okay. So, uh, one, one last question. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on the DCER technique? Uh, like uh, DCER, they talk about that uh, you can achieve uh, extension. Uh, in extension, the reduction of the of the vessel, uh, the reduction of the AD can take place if you do a DCER on one pivotal point. You compress, uh, then the the orientoid gets reduced easily. But in your cases, you are primarily putting in the C1, C2 transarticular screws. So how do you uh, reduce the AD with this technique? You see, once you open the joint, see, I put the patients on traction during surgery. Once you open the joint, the relationship between C1 and C2, the joint is absolutely free. Okay? Okay. And then I have to press C2 downwards and forwards to reduce it. Okay. That is the main thing. Okay. And make the position whatever it is. And sometimes I have to even hold it while putting the transarticular uh, trans uh, K wire. So, in uh, DCR technique, you are putting, you are doing distraction between uh, maybe occiput and C2 because most of these patients have C1 assimilated, right? So you don't have yes. C1 arch and C2 uh, lamina which you will be, I mean, uh, distracting. And then when you distract from behind, you are actually making uh, angle. So distance between C1 and C2 posteriorly will increase. Anteriorly, it would not increase. So it depends where you put it. So I'm not very much. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, you should see whatever technique you want to use. Use it, but you should dis, uh, uh, reduce the dislocation. Okay. Once you have reduced the dislocation, then you should fuse it. In DCER technique, also sometimes I have seen few patients, it's not really reduced. Okay. Mm. Thank you. I think we have Dr. Mutukumar. Uh, so, Dr. Mutukumar, you have any questions? Uh, excellent presentation, Professor Jain. It was really revealing. And I Welcome. have a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, the first question is uh, in, in your slides, I didn't see, even in probably even in the recent cases, probably you, do, you don't use spacers between the joints, isn't it? Yes. You don't seem to use spacers. Yeah. And, uh, or almost all your cases, you had you had gone for transarticular technique rather than the C1 lateral mass C2 par screw technique. Any specific reason why you do that? Yeah, I'll tell you what. Uh, first thing is the space. I don't use the spacer because primarily I told you what I believe in. I believe in central dislocation. I don't believe that so-called basilar invagination, primary pathologies, decreased joint space. Joint space has not decreased. It's when you put a spacer, you are only increasing the joint space. So if primary pathology is decreased joint space, then a spacer would work. Primary pathology is posterior and superior slippage of C2 or anterior or forward slippage of C1. So if you can correct that relationship, then it would be reduced completely and you would not require any spacer. That is first thing. And the second question was about uh, C1, C2. C1, C2, you would require to put four screws. If you put bilateral C1 lateral mass screw, bilateral C2 parse or lateral mass screw, you need to put four screws. And in trans article, you need to put only one screw. So it takes less time. It is, uh, I think it is uh, easier than putting four screws. Now you avoid those venous plexuses and all those things. And even you can easily present the T2 roots on both sides. When you try to put four screws, there is a lot of venous moving. Or, so I feel, uh, unless uh, I'm really forced to put those things, if I cannot put transarticular screw only, then I put the lateral mass screws. And uh, in those cases, not all cases of basilar imagination have uh, uh, symmetrical lateral masses. So what happens in certain cases I've observed, especially about uh, 20 to 30 percent of my patients, they have hyperplastic lateral mass, which is often assimilated with the uh, occiput. So that makes the surgery a little more difficult. Uh, what do you do in that particular condition? If there yeah, is an asymmetry right. in the lateral mass with one hyper, one mass being hyperplastic, and in fact, even the pre-op CT shows that the one joint is wider than the other. So yes, I'll tell you what. If you you are talking of hyperplastic 
uh, lateral mass in coronal view and sagittal view. Am I right? Yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. So, uh, what I would suggest, if you make two V pictures, if you if there is a little bit of rotation at C1, C2, when you take coronal views or sagittal views, they are not going through the same part of two bodies, to the same part of two. So one part may look as hypoplastic. So you should see, in all cases, pictures, rotate them completely and then see. Then you would see better anatomy. So uh, the hypoplastic lateral mass uh, is uh, rarely seen as far as I am concerned. And then you can put the screw, that is not a problem. The problem would be only if you have uh, uh, you have to put uh, lateral mass screw. But if you have to put transarticular screw, there is not much of a problem. And, uh, as long as you can pass ask can I ask one more question, John? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, what is uh, what is your uh, what are your thoughts on anterior transarticular screw fixation? Because recently, for a couple of cases, when I had to for myelinated odontoid fractures, I had to go in refracture the odontoid, and then and I went in posteriorly and did a typical C1 C2 fusion. So uh, when, once I did that, then I thought, why should I go in posteriorly when I have access to the C1 C2 if I can put in a transarticular screw anteriorly, then it should be much more easier because you have to, the anterior trans uh, retropharyngeal approach, you have to extend and during extension automatically the thing gets reduced. So, is it, uh, what are your thoughts on anterior transarticular C1 C2 fixation? I, I agree with you, anterior transarticular screw surgery can be done. It, it is not. It should not be very difficult, except that you have to get used to it. It's very high. You have to retract the pharynx. But here, it should be a reducible variety. You will not be able to do right. manipulate That's the right. joints if you are going anteriorly, as I can manipulate it posteriorly and hold the C2 spine and absolutely, absolutely. That's right. If That's it's right. a reducible variety, you can go from the neck. And maybe you can put a screws. It is. It's actually opposite side a screw is easier to put. Ipsilateral screw maybe a little more difficult to put. A little difficult to do that. That's right. Um, our friend in uh, Pune has been doing this uh, transarticular screws anteriorly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I I just did it for a for refracturing the odontoid for myelinated odontoid for a couple of cases. Then I thought maybe it should be a easy approach to do that. And then. Why, why should I go posteriorly fiddle with the <laughs> venous sinuses and all the bleeding? So, but your again. technique is. But I would again say refracturing is easier in transoral approach. You will go if you want to refracture odontoid, which is mal united. Okay. If you go transoral, it is maybe ten minutes job only. You just go in the center. Yeah, but uh, what about the velopharyngeal incompetence, etc., which the patients have post-op? No, pharyngeal incompetence occurs only when you divide the uh, uvula. I never divide okay. it. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jain. It was really, really excellent. One more. I have listened to your presentations many times, but this is also, this presentation was a really a learning experience. Thank you so much. My pleasure. It's like being at a, a real conference, Dr. Jain. Simon, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, yes, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Professor Jane, for your uh, presentation. I learned a great deal. Uh, I would like to ask a question about uh, the needs for uh, patients in the country regions who may not have uh, as much imaging uh, access. What is the, the minimum needs as far as imaging uh, in order to be able to diagnose and treat these, uh, these disorders, these problems, these accidents? Well, minimum need is just plain X-ray. Okay. And then, if it is reducible, you don't need anything else. But some patients will have very complicated CDJNC normally. Then, if you want to do a good job, then there is no question of minimum need. We need a 3D CT scan to really understand. Actually, nowadays, uh, even uh, molds are formed by computerized things to form the bones outside and learn to see exactly how it is. To be sure, how do you do it? Then. People are using neuro navigation also to put the screws. That is oh, really? another. Wow. So wow. That is what it is. I see. Thank you very much. So, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Jain, thanks for, oh, any more questions or comments? Yeah, I just wanted to add Dr. Jain very rightly pointed out recently people have started using uh, 3D print technology. 
uh, say it's a SQL model based concept. Uh, we make a very high resolution CT of the patient, and based on that, uh, the engineer can uh, give you a plastic or a resin based uh, model of the perineal vertebral junction. And the surgeon who is not so experienced enough, like Dr. V K Jain, uh, he can actually uh, practice uh, beforehand uh, the the kind of instrumentation he or she uh, wants to do. And it is a new thing to happen, and uh, we have started doing it. And uh, neuro navigation also nowadays uh, we have got two arm system or called multi dimensional neuro navigational system, which is again uh, a great great uh, tool uh, to help a surgeon in uh, deciding the trajectory. Because you need to have really very fine tools at your hand to put in the screw in the correct position in, in such a in such a region. Thank you, Dr. Bhikshan, for sharing your experience. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Deepak. Yeah. Very good. Okay, Dr. Jain, uh, thank you for being open to trying this new technology, and uh, and I hope you like it. And hope you do it. Do, do some like more that. of it, and do some great teaching. You're a great teacher. So, okay. I hope I have yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, and uh, coming out. And uh, we have the next presentation in about uh, 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.